Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Um, after a lot of requests, a lot of reflection, a lot of thought, um, we're going to be doing our first live reading um, in a very long time. Uh, if you watch regularly, you know I have not done a reading probably in like, I want to say... Going on almost, we've been on Secretary of Shade going on two years. We're entering our second year now. Probably, um, it's been, I want to say, six or seven months. Um, but I wanted to do a live reading due to people requesting. Tonight, we are going to be reading none other. We're starting Glow, the autobiography of one Rick James. I am so excited to read this. I know people have been asking. Guess your president went crazy yesterday. Um, in the press briefing, that should be no surprise to you. It's another day at the office. Um, he's batshit crazy. But tonight, um, we're going to do something a little bit fun. More fun. Um, people ask me, you know, well, what made you choose this book? I said, well, I didn't want to do anything um, political for my this reading because I feel like a lot of the books that are out now, it's a lot of rehashing what we already know. It's a lot of fluff. It's nothing that is is to me contributing more to the facts that we already have. So I wanted to do something that was fun um, and exciting. I'm going to wait for everybody to get in um, with this. Um, but I think it's going to be fun. I think Rick James is one of the most talented, first off, but very polarizing figures in music in general. Rest in peace. Um, my first read of this book, um, especially the moments where he talks about his relationship with Prince, is absolutely hilarious to me. Um, and I think that it's some of the <laughs> the best literature <laughs> That I've read in quite some time. Um, so while uh, everybody is logging in. I'm waiting for everybody to finish logging in. Looks like everybody's coming in. Um, and I'm going to read probably. The chapters are actually very short in this book. So I'm going to probably read tonight. Probably about 10 pages. Um, 10 pages. 10, 12 pages. Um, and get started. So. Without further ado, it looks like everybody um, is here tonight that's going to be here for this. This is Glow, the autobiography of Rick James, bitch. Chapter 1, Lock Up. I'm having these crazy gr dreams in jail. The dreams are so vivid, so wildly creative, that I know God is in charge of my imagination. <laughs> People always find God when they go to jail. I couldn't dream up this shit without God. God has to be the author of my dreams. In one dream, I'm with Miles Davis. We're dressed like African princes. Our robes are blue and gold. Miles is singing and I'm playing trumpet. Black angels are surrounding us. We're bathed in sunlight. We're on top of the Empire State Building and everyone in the city of New York can hear us. The people are assembled on the street. They're hanging out their windows and waving flags from office buildings. Helicopters are flying over us. But our music is so powerful that we drown out all noise. Our music is symphony that the angels dance that has the angels dancing in the sky. The drugs must have been good. <laughs> the drugs had to be good. I'm just saying, okay? That is a lot to start the book, okay? Didn't you know you could play jazz? Didn't know you could play jazz so good, Miles says to me. This is Miles Davis, bitch, talking to Rick James in his dream. Didn't know you could sing so funky, I say to him. The music is so beautiful, I start crying through Miles' horn. Someone says, the hospitals are clearing out. The patients are healed. Someone else says, the churches are clearing. The congregations are in the streets. I told you, said Miles. I told you we could do it. When I put the trumpet to my lips again, the horn turns into a megaphone. When I start to speak, I hear the voice of my mother. My son has the answer, she says. Miles gave him the answer. Listen to my son. I turn to Miles, who rarely smiles, and see that he is smiling. 
When I wake up from this dream, I'm smiling, but I'm still in jail. And the drugs must have finally wore off. I don't know what kind of psychedelics they was taking. <laughs> I can't, okay? This long stay in jail is the first time I'm remembering my dreams. I'm not even sure I had dreams before they put my ass behind bars. My mind was clogged up with cocaine. Not just any cocaine, but cocaine strong enough to fuel jet engines. <laughs> Bitch. I was a jet engine that got dislodged from the plane of my brain. I crashed to the ground and broke into a million pieces. When the pieces magically came back together, the engine could work again. But the fuel was no longer cocaine. The fuel was something I hadn't used since I was a little boy. I call it natural energy and natural drive. It's a natural restlessness to see and explore and learn. Couldn't do any of that exploring when I was ripping and running through the world of intoxicants. Didn't want to explore, just wanted to stay high. So ain't this a bitch. My highs are my dreams. My dreams are my escape. And my imagination is my way out of prison. If you break down the word imagination, I guess it means manufacturing, manufacturing images. Dreaming is the purest form of that process. So for as long as I'm locked up, I'm going to write down my dreams. I'm also going to write down my life. I've always wanted to write my own life story. But outside of prison, I could never sit down and be quiet. My energy was scattered. I was always going in a dozen different directions at once. But now I got no choice. Got nowhere to go and nothing to do. I'm forced to read. And the reading, especially about the lives of people I relate to. I get excited. I read about Charlie Parker, Nat King Cole, Bob Marley, and Malcolm X. And I understand exactly why their lives went the way they did. I see their fuck-ups as my fuck-ups. I see their talents as my talents. Sometimes talent is so big, it takes you to places that you don't understand. Super talent doesn't take you to the land of peace. It takes you to the crazy land. And if you ain't emotionally grounded in something rock solid, you're going to get annihilated. I know that's the fuck right. I got annihilated. Now I'm getting healed. And part of the healing is dreaming, remembering, and writing. I can write in peace because I don't have access to my lethal vices. Being a celebrity in jail also means I have protectors who keep the bad cats away from me. They, say I'm, they see I'm serious about writing and form a shield around me. In prison, I've grav grav gravitated toward the bookish brothers. I've met Muslims who have keep taking me deep into the Quran. I love and respect Islam. I was raised Catholic, but never really studied the Bible till late in life. The Christian brothers in prison have given me a new way to look at the word. A Jewish man has been talking about Kabbalah, mysticism, with wisdom of its own. And I think that's Kabbalah. Don't worry, I ain't going to shove no religion down your throat. I'm not using this book to win converts. I'm just using the book to manufacture images from my past. I just want to look at old pictures. Lay them out there and like a jigsaw puzzle, see if I can make the pieces fit. See if I can make sense of my life of nonsense and understand how I got to be caged up like an animal. I am an animal. A fucking wild animal. I lost my human soul. I lost my human mind. But in this animal cage, my intention is to win back my humanity. Animals can write. I can. I will. Here goes. Chapter 1, bitch. This ain't no dream. This shit really happened. <laughs> 1982. Ronald fucking Reagan in the White House turning this country more conservative than it been since slavery. And me telling my manager, I got to get out of here. Got to get to York. Little do he know, if he had lived long enough, he would be loving the Reagan era right now. But that's another story for another day, bitch. Beautiful, said my manager, because Europe has been calling. Europe wants to funk. Well, let's funk it up then, I said. Let's freak them out. What do you think of Germany, asked my manager. They're the biggest freaks of all. Let's fucking freak them. <laughs> Next 
thing I know, I'm at the airport. Whereas the cats in my band are boarding the plane. I'm standing there popping quaaludes in many of their mouths. I take two. We getting fucked up because we scared shitless of flying over the ocean. We drank ourselves into oblivion. When we land, an army of funk fans is waiting at the airport. We're treated like conquering heroes. They're waving all my albums. Come get it. Bussing out. Fired up. Street songs. And breaking out in spontaneous versions of Super Free. Chicks are uh, stuffing joints in my pocket. One fine bitch slips into my limo. Her blonde hair is in the color of sunlight. And her big beautiful breasts are practically busting through a t-shirt that says something in German I don't understand. What does that mean, I ask. A heavily accented in English, she answers, fucking is fun. She calls herself Greta and says she's my biggest fan. Are your songs about things that really happened to you, she asks. My songs are fantasies. Can I be a fantasy, she asks. You already are. The fantasy gets fatter. I'm on stage in front of the cameras for Rock Palace, a German MTV-style show that's broadcast to 150 million fans across Europe. My opening acts are the Kinks and Van Morrison. Goddamn. I get out and fire up the funk to where the riot squad is lined up in front of the stage. Doesn't matter what the audience is, that the audience is German. Those motherfuckers know every word to my every song. They're mouthing along like they grew up in the hood. They're flashing me the funk sign and won't stop screaming till I give them five encores. That night in my suite, Greta is demanding encores of her own. I'm giving, 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 loving, 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 riding high and riding low, riding Greta into the land of pure ecstatic pleasure where nothing can stop us, not even the light of morning sunshine that creeps in our room and casts a golden glow over her voluptuous body. This German angel sent to welcome me into the womb of her funk-loving motherland. Renewed and ready to take on <laughs> whatever awaits me in Reagan land. I don't need a handful of quaaludes to get back on the 747 home. After taking York by storm, I can keep the plane flying on the fuel of my energy alone. There's no way I'm going to fall out of the sky. No way I'm ever going to fall. That standing on the top song, you did with the temptation, said my manager as soon as I land. That jam is tearing up the charts. I think back to when I was a teenager running the streets of Buffalo while listening to The Temptations on my tinny transistor radio. Never thought I'd be the one who helped put them back on top, yet that's exactly what I'm doing. You got the Midas touch, says my publicist. That fire and desire you did with Tina Marie is the bomb. Tina's my protege, a deeply soulful white girl with a big voice, with a voice big enough to scare off the baddest sister. Tina's become a star. Your star's so bright right now, says a friend. All you got to do is shine your light. Shine it on anyone, and you create another star. You're the one keeping the lights on at Motown, says my business manager, referring to the label where I've been recording since 1977. You're the whole fucking franchise, baby. I'm rolling up these compliments and smoking them like joints. I'm snorting them like they're blow. The compliments are getting me higher than the actual weed and cocaine that I'm ingesting in massive quantities. On Monday, I see myself as Ivan the Terrible. On Thursday, I'm Alexander the Great. On Saturday, I'm Napoleon Bonaparte. The world is about to crown me emperor. I will rule. I will exceed whatever meager dreams I once had and move into the realm of immortality. My funk will transform the material into the eternal, the conventional into the cosmic. The planets will resonate with these rhythms coming out of me. The universe will bounce to the beats of my Stone City Band. This motherfucker. Okay. Just out of these, like, okay, pause. Just out of these first few pages. This man believed in himself. I, look, if you're going to do it, this is how you do it. Like, I ain't, it was the 80s. That's all I'm going to say. It was the 80s, bitch. I'm above earthly notions like right and wrong. I'm above the danger of human mistakes. As long as the hits keep coming, as long as I keep hitting the dope, as long as my people keep hitting me with the news of my success, I will fear no evil. 
They say Jesus died when he was 33. Well, I was taught to love and respect Lord Jesus. And when I was 33, I worried that would be the year when I, like the Savior, would meet my worldly end. But now I'm 34. I've endured the hardships. I've paid my dues so I can spread the news. My news is all good and getting better every day. I'm where I need to be. I'm in charge. I'm it. Yes, bitch. <laughs> Bitch. So, bro, next chapter, bitch. I, I can't. Okay. I've met a man in Folsom State Prison who talks about the me monster. I call this man Brother Guru because that's what he is. If you ask him if he's a Christian or Muslim, he won't say. All he says is, you ain't going to define me by no category. You ain't going to limit me to no label. Brother Guru has darkish skin and says he's a mix of many races, including African American. He won't specify what went into the mix except to say a little bit of everything. I am, he says, whatever you want me to be. He's short and solidly built, but he doesn't show off his muscles. At the same time, there's no ignoring two tattoos written up and down his forearms in bold black ink. The right one says anarchy and the left one says discipline. Ask him what that means and he says, I meet in the middle. I know that's right. Ask him how he wound up doing hard time in Folsom and he says, following the me monster. Brother Guru likes to break down the me monster. The me monster, he explains, ain't hiding in no closet. He ain't lurking around the corner waiting to mug you. He's inside you. He is you. He ain't all of you, but he wants you to think he is. He wants you to think he's the only thing that makes it safe for you to walk through the world. He's telling you that the bigger he gets, the more food you feed him, the safer you are. But that's a lie. He ain't taking care of you at all. And even though he's acting like he's your champion, your cheerleader, your biggest fan, he's really your murderer. The me monster wants to see you dead. I know that's, come on, bitch. That's the word. You really think my ego wants to kill me, I ask? Shrinks call it self-destructive behavior, says Brother Guru. I just call it what it really is, suicide. I scratch my hair, head because I'm not sure I agree. You're a smart motherfucker, Brother Guru tells me, but I'm guessing that you're too smart for your own good. I'm guessing no one could ever tell you shit. You had all the answers. Hell, you wouldn't even be listening to me if you weren't behind bars. Took these bars to convince you that your shit stinks like everybody else's. I suggest you start listening to someone besides the me monster. I'm listening to you, brother guru. That's all I got to say today. If you want to meet in the yard tomorrow, we can talk more. I wouldn't mind hearing more about your life. Have you started that book you've been talking about? I have. How much have you written? First few chapters. They any good? You tell me. I'll start reading them to you tomorrow. <laughs> the excitement of the music was always there. It was there in mom's records. It was there when I heard the voices in the dark night coming off those records. The Go Dakota Stanton talking about the late, late show. Billie Holiday looking for her lover man. But the excitement got all over me on the night that my mom took me on her numbers run. Okay. Mom was sweeter than sugar in the light of my life. I never have or will love anyone more. She was also smart as a whip. She had to be. She had to house and feed eight kids on her own. That's why she worked as a cleaning lady by day and ran numbers by night. She kept her two day jobs because they were a good cover for her gig for the Italian Mafia, the major crime force in our hometown of Buffalo. As a numbers runner, she didn't make big bread, but enough steady bread to keep us from starving. She had twinkling eyes and a loving nature. She cared for her children like a mama bear cares for her cubs. Don't even think about messing with any of her kids. And even though she was tiny in stature and had this little overbite that could make her look naive and harmless, she was neither of those things. Mom was one of the toughest ladies in Buffalo. Because my dad walked out, mom was all I had. So naturally, I wanted to be with her every minute of every day. When she asked me on a Saturday if I wanted to come with her, my little heart started beating like crazy. I practically started to cry. Yes. Just keep quiet, she said, and do what I say. 
It was one of those freezing buffalo nights with snow falling heavy and fierce wind howling off of Lake Erie. Mom had me bundled up in wool. I slipped twice on the ice. The bitter cold had me shivering. When we reached the nightclub, Mom had me hide inside her big overcoat. I loved that. I felt so protected, so secure. Once inside the door, I loved feeling the heat of the room with the chatter of the people and clanging of glasses and musicians warming up their instruments. In the back room, Mom took off her overcoat and then showed me where I could hide under a table behind the bandstand. Stay here until I come for you. I stayed. I watched. My ears blew up. My eyes popped out. I was so excited, I nearly pissed my pants. I was so happy, I nearly started screaming. I couldn't contain myself. Star time, said the MC. A tall, fat cat with slipped-back hair, lime green suit, banana yellow shirt, skinny black tie, and pointy, toe mirrored shine alligator shoes. This little lady is tearing up the country from coast to coast with hits like Roll With Me Henry and her latest Good Rockin' Daddy. All the way from Hollywood, California, let's meet and greet the hottest star in the scene. She's mean. Ladies and gentlemen, bring her out with a big round of applause for your viewing and dancing pleasure. Miss Etta James and the Peaches. Wow. Etta James came out in a fishtail sequin sparkle gold dress. She had a blonde wig on her head. Her skin was light and her body was buxom. She wore purple eyeshadow and long eyelashes. I thought she was beautiful. One peach was to her left, the other to her right. They were dark-skinned ladies in black dresses with wide smiles. I also thought they were beautiful. It was all a vision of beauty like I had never seen before. And then when Etta started singing, the vision became an epiphany. Her voice had a growl that felt deep inside my body, in my stomach, under my skin, up and down my spine. It wasn't that her voice was strange. I recognized it as the voice of my mother and a hundred women that I had known growing up. It was that the familiar voice of my neighborhood. But because she took that voice, that raw, honest, supercharged voice of real ordinary life and put it to music, I saw the ordinary world turn into something exciting and new. It was that moment in The Wizard of Oz when Dorothy leaves black and white Kansas and goes to Technicolor Oz. Etta James took me to Oz, crouched under that table, taking in her every move, relishing her every note. I discovered an excitement that I had to possess, an excitement that would change everything about me, drive my life, and turn me upside down. I also saw something else that would forever shake the boy who became, who became the man, who became the artist himself. I saw the music. The power of Etta's voice made everyone happy. I saw that the music made everyone want to drink and smoke. And that the drinking and smoking, the beer and wine, the cigarettes and the reefer were all part of the music. Part of that other world that mom was showing me. Mom moved through that world with grace and style. That's one of the reasons I loved her so much. She wasn't afraid of that world. She worked in that world. She carried those betting slips from customer to customer. She did her job of working the underground lottery for the underworld bosses with the same slick efficiency as when she ironed our clothes and fixed our fried eggs for breakfast. You like the music, she asked when she was through making the rounds. I was so happy I couldn't even speak. I see it in your eyes, said mom. Your eyes are smiling. When mom saw how deeply the music penetrated my soul, she made a habit of taking me with her when she had to run numbers at the nightclubs. I got to know the Royal Arms, the Pine Grill, and the Bonton. In those days, Buffalo was still alive. The Bethlehem Steel Mill was going 24-7. There were jobs in the black community. There was action. There was music. And not just rhythm and blues. There was jazz. Sophisticated modern jazz that mom heard and loved. She gave that love to me. She sneaked me into clubs to hear Miles Davis when John Coltrane was his side man. I got to hear Wes Montgomery play guitar and Jimmy Smith rip up the Hammond B3 organ. I got to hear cats like big baritone Arthur Priceop sing Misty and doo-woppers like the Moonglows sing Sincerely. Before I turned 10, I knew where I wanted to live. In those clubs, I knew what I wanted to do. Make that music. Outside the music, 
the world was born. But inside the music, the world was magic. Mom had brought me inside, and inside was where I was determined to stay. Um, I think that that's so interesting. I think that's so beautiful because here's the thing. Let's unpack this. When you think Rick James, because, and, and this is something that I think happens a lot, um, especially as somebody who loves music and has been making my own music, pursuing a career in music. A lot of times people know you for the sensationalism. I had a shop teacher when I was in high school. She said, Emmanuel, people don't remember all of the great things or good things that you've done. They remember that one mistake you made. And I think with Rick James, because, you know, of Chappelle's show, which ultimately helped bring a resurgence for him. But when you think about Chappelle's show and some of the more outlandish things that he did, like exactly, he started the book. What I love about it is that, he starting he started the first couple pages of this book giving you everything that you would stereotypically think about who Rick James is but as you start to read you start to find um you start to find the meaning and i think when i listened to the first time i read this book cuz this book has been out for some years um i went back and i listened to Rick James's catalog and what I found was that, A, Rick James had one of the best backing bands ever as far as on a record. The horns on, like, Give It To Me and, and like, it, it, they're amazing. His musicianship is amazing. And I think sometimes in modern times that gets lost because you're so like, I'm Rick James, bitch. But before he was Rick James, bitch, he was Rick James, bitch. You know what I'm saying? So I think that that's interesting seeing... That also, too, Etta James. Like, who thinks that Etta James is the person that inspires Rick James to want to do music? You know, that is something that you never think. But I think that that's a testament to the artistic process. Um, sometimes you learn things from your heroes. Like when he read, when I was reading, when we were reading this, and he said our vocal was raw. It was honest. It was from the street. He took that piece, but he did it in Rick James's way. He did it in a way um, that works for him. And I think that that's what a great artist does. Every artist is inspired. Be inspired, but don't plagiarize, if that makes sense. And I, I really love that. But anyway. Don't know why my daddy not to, n decided not to stay with us. My memories of the man are cloudy. I see him as a handsome dude. He liked to boast that he had Indian blood running through his veins. At night, he'd slip a woman's stocking over his head to keep his process in place. Sometimes he and mom would go out at night. When they came back, she'd be crying. He didn't like to hear her crying, so he beat her. Seeing him slap around my mother, sometimes even punch her with his closed fist, got me crying and swearing that the minute I got big enough, I'd grab a butcher knife and slit his throat. The happiest moment of my childhood came when he left and never returned. Mom never mentioned him again, not for the rest of her life. Strange to think that he gave me his name and nothing else. I was born James Ambrose Johnson Jr. on February 1st, 1948, the third of eight kids. Brother Carmen came first, then Sister Camille. Mom was only 13 when she had Carmen with a man we never met. Camille also had a different dad than us six younger kids. Thirteen. Wow. His name was Homer, a half-white, half-black dude, a serious drunk who, when mom kicked him out, got deep into drugs and disappeared down the back alleys of Buffalo. Ooh, no wonder. He was crazy. Okay. I was third born. Then came Roy, Cheryl, Alberta, William, and Penny. We were cramped into a small apartment in the Willard Park Projects for low-income, no-income families. Mom kept the place spotless. She also made sure we went to church. She thought the Catholic church would put us in a higher stratum of society. And if we joined the church, we'd get to go to Catholic schools that were, in my mom's view, better than the public schools. That's interesting. That's interesting to read because, and, and I, I, I see this a lot, especially in black communities, like, that people view church as a social, in some cases, as a social game, not a spiritual one. 
I think that's interesting. Just as she was willing to run numbers to keep us in food and clothing, she was willing to bypass the Pentecostal churches where she was raised to put us in a religious setting. She saw as more cultured. She also liked how the priests and nuns were strict, just as she had to be strict with us. Like most kids, I hated strict. I was naturally wild, and it took a lot to keep me in check. That was Sister Camille's job, because mom was either out on her day gig or running numbers at night. Camille was the enforcer. Sister was small but strong as an ox. She didn't mind using muscle to keep us in line. There was always a line of boys looking to make it with Camille, a sexy lady with good hair. In the ghetto, good hair meant waves, not kinks. My own kinking nature was there early. For all I know, it was there at birth. Maybe mom saw it and thought by putting me in Catholic school, the nuns would cure me. For a while, I walked the straight and narrow and even became an altar boy. That didn't last long. The streets were calling and so were older girls. I was nine or ten when Nancy, a 14-year-old girl, called me down to a basement in an abandoned building. She was the teacher, and boy, was I the eager student. I learned my anatomy lesson in a hurry. She was quick to show me how the parts fit together. I didn't understand ejaculation, and just before coming, I pulled out and ran to the bathroom. I thought I was about to piss. Hell no, she said. Get back over here. You ain't through. I did what I was told. Her screaming got me a little scared until I saw it wasn't pain screaming. It was pleasure. Can't say that I experienced that much pleasure. It was more like an initiation rite. Nancy invited me back down several times, and each time, intrigued by the phenomenon of inserting myself into a girl, I became better at pleasing her, and in due course, pleasing myself. As a preteen, I was on well on my way to becoming a man, at least in the fine art of fucking. Fantasies and fucking went together. The more I fucked Nancy, the more I imagined I was fucking someone else. Say a woman in her 20s with a wide booty and big titties. The nuns at school saw me looking over the girls. They saw my lascivious nature and tried to scare me. Sex is for older people, said one of the nuns when she caught me playing with myself behind the playground. Sex is for married people. God doesn't like it when kids touch themselves and think about sex. Those thoughts disrespect God and his son, Jesus Christ. Do you understand? Yes, I said. Do you believe me? Yes, I lied. Are you going to do it again? No, I lied again. Good, she said. But to make sure you don't hear something to remind you. With that, she took a ruler and whacked my hand. That night in bed, I touched myself again, thinking about what it would be like if the nun was wearing nothing under her habit. My own habits got worse. Talking back in class, cracking jokes, never bothering to do my homework. I was a quick learner, though, and none of the and one of the priests, Brother Timothy, took an interest in me. You have an exceptional mind, James, he said, but you lack discipline. What's discipline? Making yourself do things you don't want to do. Well, I said, I don't want to do discipline. That's just the point. Without discipline, there's no achievement. What's achievement? Getting things done, finding a way through the world, making money. Yes, my mom makes money. She has discipline. She's a hard worker. She's good at math. She can head up figures in her head. She never forgets a number. I was about to tell the priest that all of the number runners, uh, tell, tell the priest that of all the number runners in our neighborhood, mom got the most respect from the mafia because she never made mistakes. Better sense, though, told me that the priest didn't need to hear any of those details. One of the beautiful things about the Catholic Church, said the priest, is our confession. Through confession, we can purge ourselves of bad deeds and thoughts. With a clear mind, discipline is much easier to attain. Have you been to confession, James? Not yet. I don't know what to confess. Everything you've done, and that'll make it easier for me at school? A million times easier, the priest assured me. And I can say anything? Anything, son, and God will forgive you. I like that idea. I went to confession where I told the priest the truth. I told the priest that I've been drinking wine out of the tabernacle and thinking about putting my prick inside the nuns. Next thing I knew, I was kicked out of school. What happened, Mom asked me. I did what I was told, I confess. That wasn't a good idea, she said. Certain things no one needs to know about. The mixed message. The church says tell it all. 
Mom says, keep it on the down low. Now I understand. Now I see that the church was thinking about the soul and how it needs to be free of sin. Mom was a practical lady who had to stay free of the law. <laughs> As a kid, though, the disagreement between my mother and the church was unsettling. Rather than let the confusion linger, I took my mom's advice to heart. She was feeding me. The church wasn't. If I had crazy thoughts, I would keep them hidden. If I did crazy things, no one had to know. If sex was on my mind more than it should have been for a preteen, well, that was my business and no one else's. If Nancy kept calling me down the basement where I had learned the right rhythm of riding her into a frenzy, I wasn't about to tell a soul. Mom showed me how to deal with the world on the world's terms. She knew how to approach and who, who to approach and who to avoid. She was savvy, a quality I learned to appreciate early on. Her numbers running had gotten so good, she saved enough to get us out of the low rent projects. I was still a preteen when she told us we could say goodbye to Funky Town. We were heading over to Swan Street Bridge to a classier situation. The Perry Projects, where the apartments were not only bigger and cleaner, but everyone was white as the first snowfall of winter. Now, that was a lot. Um, I want to unpack that before we, we close the meeting. There's a lot of things, a lot of things about this first chapter that I think is incredibly sad, but provides a lot of clarity. Um, and, and, and not even so much, and this is why I picked this book, by the way, because I, I, I reread it and I knew that this was going to be a great conversation piece. Um, and that last chapter that I just read about his experience, number one, nine and 10 years old, you know, that was pretty much, that was, that was nine and 10 years old using your virginity as a boy, even though he admits he enjoyed it. But at nine and 10 years old, how do you know what you like? Um, I think that that is, that our boys don't, I, I think reading that chapter makes you understand, especially why with black men and black boys, they have a, they have a hard time going to counseling. They have a hard time expressing themselves. You know, he goes and talks to a priest who he's supposed to trust. He goes and he confesses, he talks and they kick him out of school. So that trust is broken. Um, and to have your mom, to see your mom getting abused, you know, and to see mom saying, well, I need to do the best that I can. I have eight children. Let's put them in Catholic school because that's the better way of life that will position him to be better. And when I think about that, it makes me rewind to a scene in Doubt, um, the movie Doubt with Meryl Streep and Viola Davis has a powerful moment towards the end where sometimes people make decisions based on society and mom definitely understood how society works. Um, he was exposed to a lot early. Um, and you're absolutely right. Okay. He was molested at nine and 10 years old. That was molestation. You're 14 and he's nine. And you're coming down the basement and it makes me think about everyone who has that play cousin, you know, um, in black families that nobody talks about the cookout. We all act like the shit just never happened or we don't know what's going on. We play stupid. Um, and also, too, how our boys are taught early, what it takes to really survive in this world. Um, and why they don't seek help. It took him... And as we get into this book, because I'm going to uh, read the next piece on Thursday, I'm going to pick out select parts. But um, as we navigate this world, you can understand how one could be addicted to drugs or, you know, addicted to ego and people love me and things like that. It, it's, a, it's a lot to digest. Um, and... and for the church at that time, the Catholic church, to kick him out of school instead of getting him the help that he needs. I mean, this behavior doesn't just pop out of nowhere. 
Um, it says a lot about how we treat our kids and um how we how we handle things, especially when it comes to our black and brown children. Um I think that this is gonna be an entertaining ride for us. Um, but I think it's going to give us clarity. As always, one of the things that I do, and I, I did this with Elmer Rosa's book, I always like reading material about people who we think we know or we have a stereotype about and seeing and kind of pulling the curtain back. Pulling the curtain back on those people because one thing that I, I strongly believe is that people are three-dimensional. Um, what you see on television or what you see on social media, that's only a small portion of who that person is. And I think that we often strip people of their humanity by putting them in boxes, by putting them in boxes and putting them in little caricatures. We don't have to deal with the effects that people have, um, and the, and the things that people go through, um, I think that that's so important, but um, I didn't expect for I I forgot how heavy that beginning portion is. It's hilarious, like those opening opening pages are hilarious. But that open learning about his life is 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 is, is sad and sometimes. And I always said if they do a Rick James film, because I think this would be a great film. I want Tyler the creator to play Rick James. I know you're thinking like. Dio, what the hell are you thinking? I think from an aesthetic standpoint, a look, wearing that braided wig, and Tyler being the way that he is, if he could actually pull off the acting, I think that that is who should be playing Rick. Um, but I think that that's very interesting. But on that note, thank you for joining me. We haven't read in a while. Um, first, first few chapters of Glow, autobiography of Rick James uh, with Dave Ricks. Uh, we will reconvene on Thursday at 7.15 and uh, get into a little bit deeper. I can't wait to read the parts about him and Prince. That's hilarious. But um, you guys have a good evening. Stay blessed. If you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Make sure you follow me on social media at Dapper Dan Midas. You guys have a great evening and be blessed.